Billy Bean played Major League Baseball from 1987 through 1995. He first started in the Major League with the Detroit Tigers and had a, tied a Major League record with four hits in his first Major League game. He then went on to play for the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Diego Padres. I don't know, I'm from San Francisco in Oakland. Okay, I'm an Oakland A's fan. All right. Um, that's okay, though. Uh, he was born in Santa Ana, California in 1964. He was a multi-sport star at Santa Ana High School, where he was chosen Athlete of the Year as a senior. He was selected valedictorian, also of his graduating class, and went on to become an All-American outfielder twice before graduating from Loyola Marymount University in 1986, where he holds a degree in business administration. After 30 years of living secretly, Billy came out publicly in 1999. His story was front page news in the New York Times, and subsequently he received national TV coverage with Diane Sawyer. He is currently is the only living former Major League Baseball player to acknowledge his homosexuality. Currently, Billy lives in Miami Beach with his partner of seven years, Efren Viega. They share a real estate business together, redeveloping residential properties, and very exciting, he's just put out a book which is entitled Going the Other Way by Avalon Publishing Company. He'll be signing copies of that book here. Um, it's going to be released April 21st, so you can get a jump on it and also get an autograph. And uh, he will, everybody who wants an autograph will get one and a chance to speak with him as well. Um, Billy is also starting an acting career. And... Uh, he started an episode of the HBO series Arlie? Arliss. Arliss. Okay, the way they wrote this was Arliss. The two S's were dollar signs. So, <laughs> so I couldn't figure that one out. Um, and he's also had a lead role in the theater production The Nature of the Beach, Beach which is currently in pre-production for the film the same name. He's also still a devoted competitive athlete, travels around the country playing tennis and basketball, and hopes to continue raising awareness about diversity and really we owe him a lot for coming out especially as a professional athlete as, as many of you realize that's perhaps one of the toughest areas to come out so please go ahead and welcome Billy Bean thanks Sorry about that bio. I think my mom wrote that and <laughs> sent it over. So, uh, About uh, seven years ago, I was playing uh, for the San Diego Padres. And we were, it was about April, we were finishing up uh, spring training. It was uh, after a, kind of an odd situation where there had been a lockout and the, the spring had been extended. But uh, I was shooting down the freeway coming home. We had just had a day game. I actually played. I had a couple hits. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. Um, I was in my fifth big league season. I had a great house. I had a great partner. It seemed like everything in my tiny little world was really starting to happen and, and uh, things were going good. And as I, I, I had chosen to live about 20 miles away from the stadium to try to keep my life as private as I could. Um, and that day I, I came home. Uh, it was about 11.30. We had played a night game against the California Angels. And uh, I drove into the driveway. And I had lived a very, very organized, precise, private life. And the front door was open. The lights were on. Um, it just looked like, kind of looked like to me, like somebody had broken into my house. You know, so right away I was sort of alarmed. And, and uh, I run in the, the house, and I, don't, I didn't find anybody. And I ran upstairs, and uh, I found my partner looking to be kind of passed out on the bed. And immediately I could tell something was wrong. And he was perspiring profusely. And, uh, you know, I had no idea about medical attention, what to do. I had been spoiled with trainers and, and the like for about 11 years. And uh, I put my hand on his forehead, and I could tell that he was very, very hot. And he was not responding, and, and I started to get really nervous and full of anxiety. Um, I ran, and I got a thermometer, and I checked his temperature, and it was 106 degrees. And I wasn't sure if I was reading that correctly, and all these things were going through my mind gave him some water, and he, he just was incoherent. He was telling me, like, you know, something is wrong with me, and I feel terrible. I have a terrible pain in my stomach. So I get on the phone, and I had called a doctor uh, or seen a doctor a couple months before, and he had told me to take him to the emergency room, 
get him admitted and, and see if they could get him some IV or fluid and uh, maybe calm his temperature a little bit. And uh, he had suggested a hospital that was about 25 miles away in Pacific Beach from my house. And I didn't really think about it, and that's where his practice was. Um, so I get uh, Sam in the car, and, and we head down the freeway. And little by little, I could see that he was not improving. I had tried to force some water down his mouth, and he had thrown that right back up. And it just was one of those situations that was gaining momentum in a bad way. We get to the hospital, and of course, I didn't bring any information with me. I didn't bring my wallet. I didn't do I brought my wallet, but I didn't bring his wallet. I, and uh, I tried to check in at the emergency room, and, and I found out quickly that if you're not bleeding with your head cut open, you get to sit in a chair and wait until somebody comes over and hands you some papers. And um, I told him, listen, I think there's something really wrong with my partner here, and, and uh, he needs attention right away. And they just sat us down and like, fill this out. We need his insurance information. And I said, I don't have it. And, and then they said, are you his family? And I said, well, kind of, but not really. And, and uh, you know, my name was is easy to remember. And in San Diego, I was constantly afraid that people were going to find out that I might be gay. So I lied about everything. And, um, and I lied about that right then. And, um, and they said, well, you know, without, if you're not family and if he doesn't have, you know, um, insurance documents, there's nothing we can do. You're going to have to. And I said, listen, what do I have to do to get this guy some attention? Do I have to write a check? Do you want a credit card? Do you want cash? What the fuck do you want? The guy's sick. Take initiative here, you know? So I gave them an American Express card. And I said, I, whatever it has to do, just please, you know? I don't know what to do. So they get him in. They took the credit card, if you can believe that, of course. And then, um, so we get him in there. And uh, they put us in a bed. It was really quiet. It was a hospital in Pacific Beach that wasn't that busy. And that's why I was so frustrated at the beginning, you know, that they couldn't get him in. And, and uh, through the next, like, two to three hours, somebody would come once in a while, take his temperature, and it was staying well above 100 degrees. And they had cold packs on him. They put an IV in him. They said, well, it's, he's going to calm down. But he was laboring with his breathing very, 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 uh, with a lot of difficulty. And all of a sudden, I looked at him, and I looked back, and I see he started looking yellowish to me. And, um, you know, I just was sitting by the bed, helpless, holding his hand, thinking, you know, just hang in there. Sort of like when you're, when you're an athlete and you're in your 20s, and sometimes you think, like, you're invincible. You know, I, I wasn't the kind of guy that ever got a cold or flu. I wasn't, you know, I just, it's like, just spit on it, rub it over, and you'll be fine. You know, that's what the coaches always tell us. And, and um so I just kept telling, you know, you're going to be fine. Just let's drink some water, chew on this ice. And then finally, he just stopped talking. His eyes were, you know, he was drifting in and out. Um, and I just kept running back and forth, bitching them out, saying, look it, something is wrong, and I'm getting scared, and I don't know what to do. Please, please, please just to help him, okay? Um, you know, the doctor wasn't returning the calls. It was now about 3 or 4 in the morning. Um, so f finally, around 5 o'clock... Some, uh, one of the doctors, somebody that came out I had never seen before, he came in and he gave him an injection. And he said, this will calm his breathing down because he was really laboring. And it just seemed for me, it's like that we were steamrolling in a, in a direction and it was getting more serious as the night went on, but there was nothing to define if it's just, uh, you know, food poisoning or kidney stone or all these things that happen. You think that when it's over, you think, wow, you know, we panicked for no reason, but so we're sitting there, and he, he did calm down right away. And then a little bit longer, all of a sudden, he starts flopping up and down on his bed. And then, of course, some little machines went off and some noise, and everybody came in running. There was three or four people who came in. And I'm, like, screaming, what the hell happened? What's going on? And they're like, he's, he went into cardiac arrest. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? You know, what, what are you saying? And about... 90 seconds later, he just stopped talking to the nurse, saying, like, and she just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, I don't, you know, I don't know what to tell you. And, um, you know, they have to take him to the, you know, and they were doing, it was like moving on to the next thing. And I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is my whole life here, and I need you to explain what's happening. And, and, uh, and just like that, you know, he was dead. And it's like, that was like the beginning of my education 
of what it means to be in the closet and what it means to disconnect from anyone and everyone in your life that's important to devalue the things that you love or the people you love by not acknowledging, you know, what is there, what is real, what is in your life. And I just sat in a chair and they, you know, I had like a bag of his clothes, you know, and like, and it's like your senses sort of heighten and, you know, he had been perspiring. I could smell like his clothes and it was like, it just was, I couldn't even like get to a point where I wanted to cry or, or get upset because I didn't know I really had, you know, it was just like a knockout punch that you never saw. You know, I didn't know where it was coming from. And um, and all of a sudden, in my mind, all these things, you know, I had been married for five years. I had a life. I, I had a house in Los Angeles and, you know, the in-laws and barbecues with my teammates and their wives. And, and I, I met somebody, and I left all of that. And I built this secret life and changed teams and I thought I had all the bases covered and and uh, all of a sudden all of that just sort of like disappeared and um, I just started to get like really really angry and mad at, at not not at myself yet but mad at, about everything and from feeling I, I you know thinking 12 hours before I'm shooting down the freeway in my cool car you know with music blaring thinking I, I'm the shit and it's just such a reality check of how we really have no control of what our lives are like and that has nothing to do with your sexual orientation but that's just a, a real lesson so I continued and if you can believe it I had a game that day at one o'clock and we had uh, a lot of times at the at the beginning of a season the team is required to do a lot of meet and greet kind of situations and we were supposed to meet the city council uh, it was just nauseatingly too surreal, to, you know, for me to have. And I went forth. I went home. I took a shower. I got dressed. I went back to, and I did everything I was supposed to do. But what happened was that was the day I started to go inward. And um, I finished that whole season playing. I never told my parents. I never told my brother or sister. I never told one friend um, what had happened to me. And I was going to the park every day. And what a lot of people really, I know there's a lot of athletes in this room, and there's a lot of people that love sports. Um, but what you really, really have to understand, for greatness to happen, you have to be simple in your head. It's, it's muscle memory. It's a lifetime of work for this day's game, all those things. And when you're carrying around just this blackness in your heart, and, and really, it wasn't about feeling so sorry for myself. What it, what it is, is bad things happen to everybody. You know, we've lost a lot of people. We've lost parents, siblings, friends, lovers. But what you can control, at least in my mind, is the choices that you make in your life and what's the most important things in prioritizing. And for me, coming back and looking back, that's what hurts me the most. You know, I can't control that someone I love died. That's just life. But the idea that I did not go to his funeral, I didn't tell my mother how important, you know, three years we were together. And it's just one of those things where it, it builds walls and you create distance. And people, this is the message that when we're talking about connecting with people that we've disconnected from in the mainstream world or the 90% that the advertisers market to or the, the people who don't think they know a gay or lesbian person in their life and it's not concerned with that. That's the kind of message that those people need to hear. Not about why me and you know we deserve this. They need to know the human side and the discipline and the suffering really that it takes to live a secret. About three years ago I, um, I was in Miami and uh, I was opening a business, and this big story came out about my restaurant, and I basically sort of slipped out of the closet. And um, um, I had no idea that anybody would give a shit that a utility outfielder for six years was gay and wasn't prepared for that. Um, and the New York Times and Diane Sawyer and, you know, people calling me on my cell phone that, you know, from New York City and I never heard of and how they got my number. And it was amazing education quickly about 
when, when something's interesting, they're going to find it. And I think people really have to understand if they are put in a position, or if a, let's say, for example, a baseball player who plays for the uh, New York Mets or the Yankees um, is gay, and they're, they're, they probably have a pretty good idea of how the world would stop for maybe a day or two, but they would become the center of this hurricane of media and how the dynamics of their life would change. The things that happened to me are absolutely the reason why I did not, in my opinion, live up to my talent and my ability. I feel like I could have been a very good major league player. I mean, I, I did very, very well at every other level. As soon as I got there, it was the whole training of there's no way a faggot should be in the big leagues or can hit Roger Clemens or stand in there against, you know, Randy Johnson or, you know, those are lessons that, that I absorbed by being in that environment forever. I mean, every time a guy dropped the ball or wouldn't play because his back was hurt, he was a pussy or he was a faggot. I mean, that's like, that's the dialogue in the big league clubhouse. You know, he's not a sissy. He's just, he's a queer, you know? Because that's what dad taught son to believe was weak. And that's why that environment, it's, it's like we have come so far in the last, it's amazing to me, just from when I quit playing, the idea of the images that we see on television. I mean, honest to God, the first image I ever saw of a gay man in my life was Rock Hudson on television dying. I asked my mom, I was 20 years old, I'm like, and she's like, I, I never even thought of the words HIV or virus or AIDS. Or, and, you know, it's sort of is out there floating. But when you're in a different little parameter, it didn't seem to affect me. So I didn't, I didn't care, you know. I wasn't confront. I wasn't lucky enough to know myself and understand my sexuality at 15. Like some of the people in this room or the people I meet, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed and I'm, I admire, you know, speaking at the college level and, and seeing kids are just so strong about who they are and what they want to be and, and um, that is so much more heroic and so much more important than some image on TV what, when you are interacting with that, that makes an impact on your life for, forever, you see look at this, you know, this is a, that's courage because they're living, you know amongst us and that's what I, you know, I try to, try to explain and, and it's, it's a continuing education for me, you know, the idea at first that you know, I, for 35 years, you know, I didn't have anything to do with any gay issues. I didn't, it wasn't, you know, I was gay. I was gay when I was born, but, you know, it wasn't a priority for me. The priority was not being connected to that. You know, I had, I had designs on staying in baseball after my career. I walked away because I found somebody that made me feel happy for the first time since my first partner had died, and I'm, I was so lucky to find somebody who I'm still with, and, and we have, you know, I'm, I just feel really lucky. You know, I have a great relationship, but I thought, well, my career's over, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in, maybe I'll get back into TV and, and, you know, work for ESPN or work in front office, and, you know, I have to stay in a closet. So even after my career was over, I was already, like, contemplating my plan for the future. Even after all that stuff that I had experienced, and, and I think what, for us as a group here, um, to, to, to build that bridge and understand those are lessons that we have to kind of unlearn. And for everyone who has had the opportunity, does have the courage to, to live openly and honestly, you know, you're the hero, you know, and you can make someone, most times I would say that you impact people that you probably don't even know. And that, that's how we're, we're getting closer to being everywhere and accepted everywhere and it not being an issue. I mean, who cares if a cop's gay anymore? Isn't that great? It's like, it's, it's really cool, you know? And, and your teacher, your grade school teacher doesn't have to lie about it anymore because he has, in some places, protection to allow to be who he is and, and be judged by what he provides and, and what, um, what he produces at work. You know, and I mean, I, I realize everybody in this room you guys wouldn't be here. You, you've had some hardship in your life. There's obstacles you've either witnessed or are tired of, of dealing with. And you have courage to be here, to meet strangers, and to try to make some change in a really an unpopular... Uh, it's easy to not... It's no different than the Title IX situation. It's, it's easy to just sort of accept things the way they are. You know, we live in a great country. We can get food and we can have a beer every night or whatever. Um, and we have our little bars and we have all these things. But to take 
the time to build the infrastructure and demand change, that, I think, is, um, is really what makes this such an important event and it really a privilege to, you know, to come up here and, and to participate. And it's like kind of understanding that, at least for me, after all this experience and being asked by HRC to, to speak publicly and, and thinking, you know, I don't know anything about the gay and lesbian movement. You know, I needed like a crash course. Elizabeth Birch like talked to me like for five hours, like three <laughs> days in a row, you know, and she's like, you know, da 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 da. And she's an amazing person and I love her. And, you know, she, she made me understand that I could make a little impact or a difference. And, and I was sitting here thinking my lifetime batting average sucks and I was a terrible player. I didn't live up to my talent. But I forgot that there's a lot of people who just want to play on their junior high school baseball team and they just want to play on their high school team or swim at varsity level and not feel like a gay person or a lesbian is not allowed to be in that environment, you know, that they can stand up and they can say, you know what, well, Billy Bean played and, you know, I can do the same thing. And for me, it's like, what a gift, you know, to, and what a responsibility to, to have a chance to impact someone's life and think, man, maybe it really doesn't matter if I make the Hall of Fame or not, you know? And my mistakes can, can I, my mistakes can be the mistakes that they don't have to make. And, and, and I think, you know, if I look back and if, if I was playing and I was in double A in 86, thinking about, you know, getting engaged to my ex-wife, and I would have seen someone like me, I, it would have made me address who I am and what I am. It might have saved a lot of heartache, you know? And that's where I feel like it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to shake your hand. Um, and for me, two years ago when I sat down, I thought, I, I have to write really what happened in my life because you can't say it in 20 minutes on an edited film script with Diane Sawyer, you know, or, or someone else's words in a New York Times article. It's, it's, it's really a, a, just kind of an honest documentation of what it's like weaving in and out of the environments that we have to, you know, the, or the concessions that we have to make in order to a, achieve or realize your dream. And I think that, you know, the reality of how difficult it was to find a publisher to believe, you know, where and everywhere I went, people were like, when is your book comes out? When is your book coming out? I'm like, I don't even have a book. Nobody wants, nobody wants to read it. But, you know, finding a way to, to let somebody have a reference and, and forever and see this, this, you can get through this kind of thing. And you don't need to go down these dark roads. And your parents aren't the last people in the world that you should consider talking to. You know, and, and maybe we're just getting so close with the way the world is sort of evolving that, that, um, that these, these kids might not even be confronted with the same type of problems. But, but still, if there's a kid who's a superstar at varsity baseball in high school, like we said earlier, you know, and he's, he's already out. And now he's confronted with continuing. I have a very good friend here who was a Division I basketball player, and he, he, he took himself out of the mix because he didn't want to have to deal with the other people's bullshit. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we can't have happening anymore, you know, to, to squash away dreams. For me, I meet somebody and I thought, well, there's, I can't go through that again, so I'm, I'm shutting it down. 30 years old, you know, ask Dave how long it takes to get to big leagues. You know, you just, it's like, it's, it's, that's a bad choice. And those are the kind of things that I think that all of us if you're a coach or you're, you're a coach of the swim team or crew team or you're an ex-player and, and, you know, you're organizing opportunities for people to play, think about just that tiny little thing and think about how great sports are and what a positive outlet for energy and growth and, and, and for other people to see that, you know, that there are parents in Kansas City and don't think they know a gay person or, or, and see that, we're, you know, this is what we want to promote. This is what we're about. It's not about being different, having to dress differently and, and, you know, individualize ourselves because we demand to be noticed. You know, we're, we've, we've come a long way, and, and um, I think that is the things that we should focus on. I really, really do. And um, I just think that uh, you guys should, should really, really be proud of putting this conference together. And, you know, I hope that it 
happens every year. I'd love to come back. I'd love to meet people. And I, and I just think that, uh, you know, for me, I think about where it was when I started playing and where it is now. And uh, it's just, it's really, it's really a thrill. And I think you guys should be proud of yourself. So thanks. I certainly think I speak for a lot of people in the audience. I was pretty much transfixed for the whole story, especially uh, as a doctor listening to the story, what he went through. Um, the other thing is I, I think I've found my new gay superhero. <laughs> and uh, so I never had a gay superhero. when I, was, I, I liked Aquaman, but I don't know if he was gay or not. So, but now my new gay superhero is Billy Bean. Thank you, Billy. What you did was really powerful, and you uh, certainly touched my heart. Thank you. Okay, next, I have the pleasure of introducing Robert Dover. He was a member of the United States Olympic team in 84, 88, 92, 96, and 2000. He has three Olympic bronze medals in equestrian dressage. He's also been the team captain for the U.S. team, United States equestrian team at all five games. Um, he's done a lot of media interviews for news and sports-related programs. He's also worked on PBS documentaries prior to the more recent Atlanta Games. Um, he's also been on Good Morning America, NBC Sports. He's also done work for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Uh, he's fluent in German and French. He also has been an international sports ambassador for many years, making personal appearances on TV and radio. And he's a, an all-around advocate for gay rights and uh, gay sports, and we're very pleased to have him here. Um, you know, it's moments like these that we're, we can't quite believe that this all came together, and, and we have the pleasure of welcoming you both. So let's go ahead and welcome Robert, Robert Dover. I'm so happy to be here with all of you, and especially since this is the inaugural meeting and uh, convention, and I have a great belief that in three years to come, this num we're going to need a much, much bigger room. I have a feeling that there will be thousands of people after they hear about and see the results of this convention coming back in future years for future conventions. <laughs> When I, when I listen to my bio being read, I'm thinking, well, first of all, that was the bio that I had sent out for, um, for my acting career. So it really had nothing, not too much to do with my sports career. And so I just want to say, yeah, I've been on five Olympic teams, and I've been around for a long time within the Olympic family. Actually, I was pretty much groomed to be an Olympian since I was 13 years old. I, ha I, w I rode with the coach of the Olympic team from that time in my childhood. And I um, was trained by Germans to think of my sport first and basically everything else after that. So like many athletes within the Olympic movement, I was completely tunnel visioned from the beginning to pretty much the end of my career. And there is something good to be said about that, and that is that if you're on a team uh, representing your country, you basically want to be with teammates that think, live, breathe, and eat their sport because you want to win a medal. That's what we're there for. We're there for winning medals. And so that's a wonderful thing. On the other hand, other life issues generally don't come to the forefront in athletes' careers until they're either moving out of the best time of their life in their 
in their uh, athletic career or unless something comes up in their life that forces them to see that there are other things in the world other than their small, their skate not fitting right or their horse not doing the right thing or a ski not being perfectly mounted. So um, I will tell you that if I wanted to add to my bio right now so that you know really who I am, besides being an Olympian, the things that I'm most proud of is that, one, I have an incredible lover who, have, who I've had for 15 years who has been basically the best thing that ever happened in my life. And without him, I really don't know what I would even want to do, no less do. So that's one thing. And, and secondly, with him eight years ago, as I was thinking I was approaching the end of my competitive life in my sport, I had several friends who were ill with AIDS, and two of them died. And it hit me that I needed to do something about that. And so along with my lover and one other guy, I started a foundation called the Equestrian AIDS Foundation. And the Equestrian AIDS Foundation was brought about to help people within the equestrian world who are suffering from HIV or AIDS. And now eight years later, this foundation is taking care of people across the United States from six-year-old to a 68-year-old who are all anonymous to us on the board of directors, but um, are being helped in every part of their life from their med medications to their housing to their cars or whatever they need, we support them 100%. And 98, 98 cents on every dollar goes directly to helping those people that are living with HIV. So, those are the things that I'm really proud of. I also wanted, though, to talk with you about my experience as, as uh, an Olympian and being gay within the Olympic movement. In 1984, that was my first Olympics, so it was also my first international competition of any kind. And first of all, I want to tell you, I went there thinking that I was going to win the gold medal. I was basically a kid in my 20s, and I had no idea that there was anything called politics in my sport. So I went there thinking that I was going to win, and I ended up being 16th. And um, I remember when the press came to me afterwards, and they said, well, Robert, how do you feel about your competition? And I couldn't even remember my competition. It was like just sort of a blur that happened to me. But I remember the rest of the games. And the thing that I remember the most is walking down the street with the United States Olympic team, 650 strong, getting ready to go into the um, stadium. And all of a sudden, everybody started chanting USA, USA, and it got louder and louder. And we ran in screaming at the top of our lungs, USA, USA. And you know what? The idea of being a gay athlete was the furthest thing from my mind, I have to tell you. I was all about being an American Olympian. And what that says to me is that we are, as a group, athletes who are also interested in sports, but what we're really still fighting for is acceptance within our society, acceptance within our community, acceptance from ourselves, because I think that a big part of this with being athletes is that we still, as Billy mentioned, have not come as a whole to accept ourselves and until we do that, it's impossible for, for us to be completely accepted by everyone else. There are very few people that walk into Nike and would walk up and say, 
I am looking for money, will you fund me, and I am a gay athlete. They are going to, if anything, um, not mention it, if not try to say or portray themselves as something the exact opposite. So what I will say this, as the years went by, 1988, um, the, uh, well, we got in so much trouble for 1988, trying to march in, saying USA, screaming USA, USA, that that was never allowed again. But um, in 1992, the games became a different experience for me because I started feeling that it was important that I be able to express myself as a gay person and not just as an athlete. So I took my boyfriend with me. During the competition, I lived away from the, the Olympic Village so that I could stay with him. That was the first time that I ever met with any kind of a negative feeling from the Olympic Committee because they wanted us to stay within the village if they could possibly make us. And I was determined that I was going to stay with my boyfriend and they didn't obviously want him to be in the village. So I left and I stayed out by the horses in a searingly hot hotel room for way too much money. And, um, but still, I was happy that I could have him with me. In 1996, again, being in Atlanta, um, there was, um, I think, a, a greater feeling of freedom. And I remember sitting with the American team and being told about how to deal with the press. So what they did was they brought a person up who dealt with the press for the USOC and they said, okay, what you have to do is you have to have a hook. You have to be able to say something to the press that is going to make them want to showcase your sport and if you're interested in promoting yourself, in showcasing yourself. So I'm sitting out in the back and I was the last one to go, so they, they, they had each person come up and they said, okay, give a little spiel for the press. And finally they came to me and I walked up and I said, well, I'm basically the United States Equestrian Team's gay token Jewish athlete and I've been on four Olympic teams and I already have two medals. And so from that point forward, the press followed me around. <laughs> through the Atlanta Olympics. Matter of fact, the, the bomb threat that happened in Atlanta happened about two hours before my competition. I was the first American athlete to, to, in, from all of the Americans to compete that year. And so they wanted to know before I went into the ring, you know, how I felt about this, this bomb threat. And I'm thinking, well, I wasn't thinking about the bomb threat, to tell you the truth. I was trying to think about my competition. And... Um, so, it, so at any rate, Atlanta was interesting from that point of view. Now to 2000, Sydney, which was the most gay-friendly, fantastic event that I think that I have ever taken part in. It was filled with activities for gay people throughout from the beginning to the end. The last night during the uh, closing ceremonies, uh, I watched the closing ceremonies and then went to a huge party called Frisky that they had down there, which was like, I don't know, 5,000 incredibly beautiful people, but also a lot of the athletes came. So what I saw from 1984 through the year 2000 was that not only are we there, we're there to stay, we were always there. We were there probably in the same percentage as you see in the rest of society. We are there in swimming, we're there in diving, we're there in shot putting, we're there in rowing, we're there in every sport in probably the same percentages, which I think are higher than a lot of people, but the same percentages that, are, that there are in society. And whatever it is genetically that we've come to hear about as being the gay gene, it most definitely in no way, shape, or form has anything to do with how fast we're able to run, 
how high we're able to jump, how hard we're able to row or throw, in my case, how well we're able to ride. And what that means is that we're able to win the day on any given day, regardless of anything else. And that's what we all have to remember, I think, is that we are not just as good as everybody else. We can be the best there is on any given day in any sport there is. And whether we're women or men, we need to promote ourselves as great athletes, but most importantly, we need to promote ourselves as great people. Thanks very much.